good afternoon to everyone i welcome all of you to the 86th lecture in the lecture series in nonlinear dynamics conducted by the department of nonlinear dynamics for the dawson university with the support from rusa 2.0 it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker dr kanagaran sheshayanan dr kanagaran obtained his phd in physics from ecole normale superiore paris in the year 2017 He did his postdoc for a couple of years in CEA Paris, Sakhalin. He then started his teaching career in IIT Kharagpur as an assistant professor in the year 2017. He had received Ecole Normale Superior Master's Scholarship and Ecole Polytechnic Master's Scholarship during his time there. In his short and distinct career, he had published more than 10 articles in reputed international journals. With this short introduction, now I invite Dr. Kanabaran to deliver his lecture. Over to you, Dr. Uh, thank you, Professor Andilwell. Yeah, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk uh, talk about my work and what I do here. So, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. So, uh, I am Kanabaran Shishya Sainan. So, I work at the Department of Physics. So, here I took some uh, photo which I found uh, was nice of Department of Physics at IIT Kharagpur. so if you are visiting kharagpur any time i welcome you all to come and say hi uh, to me in the department of physics so uh, today's talk i'll be uh, talking about transitions in turbulent flows and extreme events so before i uh, go into the topic as such uh, i just want to introduce you uh, to you all uh, what what do we mean by these transitions and uh, why are we interested in extreme events in such kind of things so turbulence is a is a well known problem uh, which is ubiquitous so it's uh, observed in many different uh, situations for example uh, if you look at uh, the uh, flow behind an airplane you have this wing tip vortices which are uh, generated by the flow past the wing tip and that creates uh, strong turbulent motions and why is it turbulent is because the typical reynolds number which is the uh, ratio of the uh, nonlinear term over the linear uh, dissipation term so when the reynolds numbers are very large which is typically the case here uh, what happens the nonlinearity becomes very strong and uh, you typically typically get chaotic or spatio temporal chaos or turbulent kind of motions and uh, here you see some strong uh, vertical motions along with strong fluctuations which are typically characteristics of turbulence and uh, if you go beyond just uh, industrial application if you just look up in the sky one can see strong turbulent motions in the atmosphere also and these strong turbulent motions can lead to formation of large scale vortices uh, you can have small scale fluctuations and uh, such strong turbulent motions uh, drive our uh, weather and climate patterns <coughs> and and uh, turbulence is uh, very much a study topic in uh, geophysical flows for yeah. example excuse me do you <coughs> do you distinguish between turbulence and chaos so uh, i would call uh, yeah it's a good question so turbul so chaos i would not say it's uh, spatio so if you have a distribution of energy across different length and time scales as in you have a, a scaling law in a sense you have a flux of energy or you have a let's say a cascade of energy across different time and length scales then i would call that a spatio temporal uh, chaos which uh, leads to turbulence actually so chaos i would say you don't need to have this uh, distribution of energy across different uh, length uh, length scales for example it can just have temporal chaos uh, so spatio temporal chaos then you will associate with uh, turbulence so even spatio temporal chaos you can you do not need to have an energy spectra like so when you look at an energy distribution across different so you have a continuous energy distribution across many different uh, length and time scales so even spatial spatial temporal chaos uh, you can you don't I mean in certain situations you might not need a, a continuous distribution of energy but what i would call turbulence is spatial temporal chaos with a continuous uh, energy distribution across many length and time scales okay okay thank you okay um yeah so uh, so geophysical flows uh, people study uh, turbulence across uh, so basically uh, uh, strong chaotic motions of all different time and length scales where you have energies uh, that are condensing at large scales and also the small fluctuations at small scales 
and uh, finally if you look at astrophysical systems like here the recent juno mission which uh, studies the polar caps of uh, other planets so jupiter for example so you can also see strong uh, turbulent motions in these uh, atmospheric uh, uh, flows of these planets so turbulence is kind of uh, seen uh, everywhere even the flow beneath uh, let's say the fan that we are sitting uh, can create uh, turbulent motions or flow to a pipe and so on. So turbulence is, uh, is observed in many different situations, but the interesting thing is that it's not, uh, it's not a monolith, as in there's no one form of turbulence. There are, you can have different forms of turbulence, and uh, in certain situations, one can look at transitions between different kinds of turbulent flows. So here on the left-hand side, uh, I show some experimental results of a uh, flow past a bluff body. So by bluff body, as in it doesn't have any sharp edges. So let's say here the sphere. So uh, CD is the drag coefficient. So it's typically the drag uh, uh, divided by the uh, uh, rho u square, uh, some factor. So basically, uh, it is known that the dissipation coefficient in turbulent flows in the limit of zero viscosity or in the limit of large Reynolds numbers, the dissipation uh, <laughs> rate goes to a constant. So this is known in, uh, in 3D turbulence and it's called, uh, uh, it's actually also called the zeroth law of turbulence. As in, uh, even if the viscosity tends to zero in the asymptotic limit, you never get zero dissipation. So, um, so the drag coefficient goes to a constant at large Reynolds number. But what happens in this particular system is that uh, at very large Reynolds number, there's a sudden transition uh, which is actually what is known as, uh, in the engineering literature, as the drag crisis. As in a, a strongly turbulent flow uh, uh, goes from one form of turbulence to another, another form of turbulence, and it's related to some dynamics at the boundary layers. So this um, sudden transition is basically a transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence, and you can see that it asymptotes to some, some other dissipation coefficient value. And uh, this is one of the examples of transitions between different types of turbulent flows. And on the right hand side, here I show some experiments where, uh, by Joe and Hero, so where they uh, took uh, liquid metal in a thin layer, Galveston here, and then they passed uh, currents in the, let's say, the vertical direction, and they had uh, magnets of opposite polarity below. And because of the Lorentz force, this is, since this is a conducting fluid, it uh, created a body force which drove the uh, drove the liquid. So you have charged particles which for, which feel the uh, J cross B force, uh, Q times V cross B force, and that kind of drove uh, the liquid to make such uh, interesting patterns. And uh, what uh, they observed is that uh, even in the such kind of flows, you can observe certain kind of transitions in the highly turbulent regime. So for example, you start forming this large scale vortex and then uh, below, uh, above a particular control parameter, these start, this large scale vortices start reversing spontaneously. So uh, turbulence as such is, is cannot be just called as one single phenomena. You have different forms of turbulence and in many of these situations, we see that turbulence can jump from one form to the other. And uh, if, you, if you again go back to the geophysical flow example that I was talking about in the atmosphere. So here is an interesting observation where they look at the atmospheric flows in the northern uh, hemisphere in the mid latitudes. So these are constant pressure lines. And usually uh, the flow is that you have a west, westward current uh, which uh, flows uh, in the uh, mid latitude, which people call as the zonal flow. Uh, so you have this nice flow structures but what happens is that from time to time, suddenly there are some vortices which uh, kind of uh, intrude into this uh, into this uh, uh, zonal flows. And what happens is that these flows uh, start uh, flowing over the polar regions. And because of this uh, uh, flow, which is getting disrupted, cold air from the uh, cold air or cold temperature uh, uh, is being transported from the uh, uh, polar caps to the uh, to, to more the, the northern um, hemisphere and you from uh, these uh, are typically of the order of 10 to 15 days they, the orders of 10 tens of days which they last and you have strong temperature fluctuations uh, from time to time uh, the, the American continent actually experiences such strong uh, such cold winds actually so um, such kind of turbulence so basically you had a turbulent flow below before which people call as the zonal flow 
and then here in this situation you have what is known as a blocked flow because of this vortices which kind of block this flow of this uh, zonal structures so this is a blocked flow so there's a spontaneous transition from a zonal flow to a blocked flow and uh, people have studied uh, such kind of uh, transitions in an experimental setup where they also observed the spontaneous uh, transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence and uh, finally i uh, show an experiment uh, again on uh, what is known as the vks dynamo experiment so we all know that uh, the earth has a magnetic field and the magnetic field of the earth is created by what is known as the dynamo process so basically what it says is that the uh, flow of conducting fluid uh, can create can drive a magnetic field uh, spontaneously so this is actually happening in the outer core of the earth so uh, this experiment was sup is supposed to mimic this particular process so um, you have a liquid metal let's say sodium which is put into this uh, cylinder uh, in into this container and you have these two propellers which are counter rotating and basically uh, beyond a particular reynolds number uh, so basically this is the reynolds number of the order of 10 to the power 5 10 to the power 6 uh, the magnetic field uh, uh, there's a sudden creation of a magnetic field and uh, you form you go from uh, let's say pure hydrodynamic turbulence to magneto hydrodynamic turbulence so there's some kind of a transition between one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence and there's some interesting dynamics with this <laughs> uh, any question no i think uh, uh, by mistake yeah. I mean. so basically you have uh, different forms of turbulence that can be generated so you here is a system which is more for the for the magnetic field so mht uh, turbulence so if you and you have conducting fluids beyond a particular reynolds number you do have a different form of turbulence as to the case before the, that particular critical reynolds number so in many of the situations uh, we see that uh, the system can transform from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence as some kind of a pa control parameter is changed so this reminds us of uh, what are known as phase transitions in statistical physics and uh, the basically uh, in this talk i will uh, be trying to uh, connect such kind of transition between turbulent flows to two known methods of equilibrium and non equilibrium statistical mechanics so uh, what happens close to such transition so you we all uh, so i talked about different forms of turbulence transitions from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence so by uh, looking at the difference between these turbulent flows we can define an order parameter which i call as q alpha uh, and then a control parameter which can be typically the reynolds number or some other parameter that you are controlling so as one can one changes this uh, control parameter there's a transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence which remains one of phase transitions right so you have from liquid to gas phase transition or if you want to look at ising models so you have different forms of phase transitions that can occur so here for in the turbulent regime we have in a system which is in out of equilibrium and uh, this is a transition between one form of out of equilibrium system to another form of out of equilibrium system and this transition occurs uh, as we change a control parameter so this is an example of let's say an out of equilibrium transition between uh, two systems and the question is uh, what kind of uh, transition does it go through and is it a smooth transition from one form of turbulence to another is it like a second order phase transition where you have a critical point and there's a critical exponent which is associated close to the critical point or is it like a first order phase transition where at the critical point the system jumps from one form of turbulence to another and uh, the answer is that depending on the system we one can observe any of these uh, different situations right so basically uh, we get transitions due to change in the direction so here uh, this control parameter can be thought of some cascade uh, related something related to the cascade for example and then uh, by looking at different systems let's say thin layer turbulence where uh, if you take turbulence in a box and then you kind of reduce the uh, dimensions along one direction you go to what is known as a thin layer turbulence uh, where you actually go from a three dimensional system to a two dimensional system so it's a dimensionality reduction that also uh, leads to such kind of uh, phenomena or the, later on i will be talking about what are known as rotating flows why are they interesting uh, so in the, in many many of these examples uh, which have been studied uh, which can be found in this uh, recent review article uh, they find that one can uh, one can transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence and depending on the system uh, it can it can resemble a certain types of phase transitions 
but I do remind you that this is a, an out of equilibrium system and the transition is happening from one form of out of equilibrium system to another form of out of equilibrium system. Why do we call it out of equilibrium? It's because it's a forced dissipative system. You do not have a concept of a temperature in the problem. Okay, so uh, with that, um, another reason why uh, we are interested in uh, looking at such kind of transitions is that um, these such transitions can lead to what are known as anomalous exponents, where the role of fluctuations play an important role in these transitions. So uh, if one takes, uh, let's say, the simple uh, mean field theory model for Ising uh, systems, Ising-like systems, or let's say uh, one looks at uh, what is known as the amplitude equation for the pitchfork bifurcation. So x is the order parameter, mu is the control parameter, and one can see that when mu go crosses mu c, which is the critical point, uh, you get stable solutions which are uh, x going like root of mu minus mu c. So one just has to put this to zero and gets x is equal to root of mu minus mu c as one of the possible solutions. Right? So there's an exponent for the first moment of the uh, order parameter, which goes like mu minus mu c to the power half. So this is the mean field exponent. And what happens in such kind of transitions between different types of turbulent flows is that the exponents that one gets can be strongly coupled or st strongly determined by the kind of fluctuations in the underlying uh, flow. So because this is a transition from a turbulent flow to another turbulent flow, there's a strong fluctuation which are present already in the turbulent flow. So these fluctuations can actually drive uh, the system to, uh, to, to do a phase transition, which is kind of non-trivial to understand. So here, the, depending on, so here I consider two different cases. Uh, so if, we, if one considers random case or turbulent case, what these people have found is that the exponent close to the critical point can be, um, can be drastically different uh, depending on different situations. So the uh, curve here, uh, mu to the power half is basically the mean field exponent. So that is what one gets when you just put this to zero and look at the solutions for x for mu get the mu c one gets, one is supposed to get uh, this um, nice uh, mean field uh, theory exponent. But what happens is that if, you look, if one looks at the first moment of such kind of phase transitions, uh, the uh, the moment, so the points lie on some uh, some other exponent which are non-trivial. So sometimes one can get anomalous exponents and so on. So uh, the question is, what kind of controls is such transitions? Uh, can we try to understand uh, the origin of such exponents? Um, can, can one try to build up a model, like let's say an amplitude uh, uh, equation model for such kind of uh, systems. So, uh, so these are the interesting features for the transitions between turbulent flows. And in this talk, I'll go into one such kind of, trans one such kind of transition to uh, basically uh, motivate our ourselves to study that and also to look at uh, the cause of such transitions and the links to extreme events in those kind of flows. So uh, in this, uh, so the next part, I'll be talking about what are known as rotating flows. So rotating flows is nothing but you take a flow in a tank and you start rotating the tank and the uh, flow that is uh, uh, in the, inside the tank, which let's say has a fluid, if you force, you can also force the fluid with to uh, some other motion. Uh, so the flow that sets in is called a rotating flow. And uh, usually in rotating flows, there are two interesting phenomena that uh, happens uh, immediately once uh, the system starts rotating fast enough. So first is that uh, the system starts to form this columnar vortices, right? So usually in a turbulent flow, one looks at, when one looks at turbulent flows, you have all kinds of small scale fluctuations. And uh, typically the structures that one see of constant vorticity lines are basically very small structures. But in a rotating system, what happens is that one forms this strong columnar vortices. So, these, so here's a simulation of 3D turbulence in a rotating box, so basically you have a fluid which is rotating, and uh, what happens is that you you kind of force some turbulence using some, uh, let's say, some propellers and so on. So what happens is that uh, as soon as the system starts rotating fast enough, the flow starts to form this columnar structures. So here is a positive uh, vortex, and here is a negative vortex, and uh, you see that this vortices, vortex columns, are almost. Uh, uniform along the direction of rotation. So the direction of rotation is along, it's actually in the z direction, which is basically the direction in which uh, these columnar structures are uh, invariant upon. So basically along the direction of rotation, the system becomes invariant. And this is what is known as 
also known as the taylor thordman theorem so first thing is the formation of this columnar vertices and the other thing uh, which is interesting with respect to rotating flows is that they admit what are known as inertial waves so the inertial waves are basically uh, bulk waves so these are waves that propagate into the system like we are all familiar with surface gravity waves so if one when one goes to the beach for example one looks at waves that are that are coming towards us but these waves are waves that propagate into the system so these are bulk waves that are uh, that are flowing into the system and this is again a, a, a manifestation of the fact that the system is rotating so these are two important features of rotating flows formation of this such kind of columnar structures and also uh, existence of these uh, inertial waves so here is an experiment where they oh sorry uh, where they uh, Uh, they have what is known as a wave maker, so it's some kind of perturbation that is uh, being uh, set up, and this is a, a rotating system. So you have uh, perturbations that is uh, that is forcing some kind of waves that are propagating, and uh, these are being captured by uh, what is known as a particle image velocity velocimetry technique. So basically, you see uh, particles which are moving uh, based on such kind of uh, flow structures. So you have this inertial waves which are present, and then you also have columnar vortices. so these are two important features of rotating flows and uh, the question is uh, what is the transition that we are talking about right so we are interested in transition between turbulent flows and what is the transition that we are looking at uh, in such kind of systems so it is known that when uh, rotation becomes important the flow almost becomes uh, independent along the direction of rotation so that is basically uh, because of this taylor thordman theorem i was talking about the uh, flow structures become independent along the direction of rotation and uh, basically the flow becomes uh, what is known as a two dimensional turbulence so basically the formation of the strong large scale structures is what is expected in 2d turbulence and if you remember the uh, the atmospheric flows that i short talked about so this is a typical aspects of 2d turbulence the formation of large scale structures as compared to 3d turbulence where you have more small scale structures which are present so uh, as one increases rotation there's a transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence in the sense that you have uh, flow structures which are kind of two dimensional which becomes completely two dimensional actually but with no variation along the axis of rotation as compared to a situation where the flow becomes is three dimensional which breaks down into small scale structures so this is a transition as one increases what is known as the rotation rate so as we take a fluid and we start rotating faster and faster one can uh, expect uh, to go into a, a two dimensional turbulent state and actually recently uh, it has been shown that uh, in the limit of very fast rotation the system actually becomes exactly two dimensional as in uh, it's two dimensional turbulence in a sense it's still uh, spatio temporal chaotic with a distribution of energy across uh, different length and time scales but its dependence along the axis of rotation goes to zero and uh, as uh, so this is when the system is rotating very fast and when the system is not rotating that fast uh, you basically go back to 3d turbulence which is basically that kind of turbulence that you observe uh, uh, near by let's say so in the in dated way examples right so there's a transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence this is again a phase transition uh, the question is is this a some kind of phase transition uh, do we have uh, let's say uh, some kind of critical exponent so these are all questions that people are studying and the, uh, the more important question that i will try to uh, talk about is what controls this transition so can you predict such kind of transitions uh, what is the parameter that one looks at to tell when do when does uh, 2d turbulence or uh, fast rotating flows become three dimensional and vice versa so why is one interested in such things is because such kind of flows are routinely observed in uh, in atmospheric flows or in flows in other uh, planets and also in oceanographic systems so understanding the uh, such kind of uh, transitions will help us understand the kind of dissipation rates and and uh, other uh, related flow parameters that one can measure in these systems so um, the the point is that we will try to understand the transition from 2d turbulence to 3d turbulence and the in the rotating flow there are two non dimensional parameters which is the rossby number and the reynolds number the rossby number tells us uh, how important is inertia with respect to rotation 
and the the Noth number is basically the the inertia or the nonlinear term with respect to the viscosity or the dissipation. So when nonlinear terms are strong, basically when all the, when the Noth numbers are very large, uh, you you end up going into a chaotic, uh, basically turbulent system when the Noth numbers are large enough. And uh, similarly, when you have Rossby numbers where the nonlinear term is not strong enough as compared to rotation, then what happens is that the effect of rotation becomes very strong. So in that in that limit, in very low Rossby limit, when rotations become very large, you end up getting what is known as 2D turbulence, still with the Noth numbers very large. So basically, you have two different control parameters, and uh, as when Rossby numbers are large, basically uh, one gets to uh, 3D turbulence. So where you have uh, strong fluctuations uh, along all directions. So one can define an order parameter, which is basically a three-dimensional flow. Uh, how much three-dimensionality is the flow? And the control parameter, which is dependent on the rotation rate, and ask when the such, such flows transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence, or one form of uh, non-equilibrium system to another form of non-equilibrium system. Right. So uh, this one can do uh, in a numerical setting, and uh, basically this is uh, because there's an exact limit where the system becomes exactly two-dimensional at very very low the values of Rossby numbers. So it is known that it exists, but the exact threshold is not known. So myself and Basil Gale, who uh, was my postdoc advisor at that time, so we were looking at this exact uh, threshold uh, where the system goes from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence. And uh, how does one study such a system is to look at uh, what is known as a linear stability analysis on the uh, underlying fluctuating turbulent flow. So basically, we look. We start with such kind of columnar vortices, and then we perturb these vortices and ask the question: When do these columnar vortices break down? So when the system becomes three-dimensional, the, all the columnar vortices start mixing around, and it becomes three-dimensional. So the question is: When do these vortices? When are these vortices stable to perturbations? When are these columnar vortices unstable to perturbations? So that is basically the threshold from 2D turbulence to 3D turbulence. These vortices themselves, the dynamics. It's highly turbulent because the typical Reynolds number is very large, and you typically one typically gets turbulent motions before and after the threshold. Yeah, so uh, one can do a, a, a formal uh, stability analysis, and uh, one has to take down the Navier-Stokes equation. So I do not want to go into the details of this derivation. It's basically a, a linear stability analysis. So you have a base state, and then you perturb the state. And then you ask the question, when do these perturbations grow on top of the base state? Because the base state is also evolving, one has to evolve the equations for the base state, and also one has to evolve the equations for the perturbations that go on the time-varying base state. Right? So for that, one has to evoke the Navier-Stokes equation in the rotating frame, which is basically the fluid, uh, which, is, which are the equations that, are, that the fluid uh, obeys. So what we are interested in is when do these perturbations, uh, so omega TD is just a uh, vorticity, which is just a curl of this uh, perturbation. So when do these perturbations grow exponentially? Right? So whenever these perturbations grow exponentially, you have 3D perturbations or t-dimensionality, which sets in into the system. And whenever these decay exponentially, uh, you have uh, the system being stable, the columnar vortices being stable to these perturbations, right? So U2D represents the columnar vortices. U3D represents the three-dimensional perturbations that go on top of these columnar vortices. And what we see is that, uh, so here is a simulation of such a system at a particular set of parameters. And basically what we change is the Rossby number, the, the strength of this rotation. And uh, what happens is that for, uh, for systems which are fastly rotating, the rotation rates are fast enough, any perturbation that one puts, it decays exponentially. So this is the log of the perturbation as a function of time. And uh, for any perturbation that one puts, this uh, the energy decays exponentially in time. So you take columnar vortices and you put, so this is a fluid and rotating plane, which forms this columnar vortices. And one perturbs this system, and these perturbations uh, die exponentially. And uh, as uh, the rotation rate is reduced, so when the system becomes more and more uh, like a system which is not rotating, what happens is that these perturbations, uh, they start growing exponentially. 
and an exponential plot in a log length scale. So this is a logarithmic of the perturbation and linear in time. So an, an exponential usually is a straight line. But here one can see an interesting dynamics is that from time to time there's an exponential growth and at other instances there's a uh, decay. So this is basically a manifestation of the fact that the underlying flow is turbulent. So you have a, a growth of perturbations on a, on a, on a chaotic uh, or the fluctuating system. Uh, and uh, these perturbations, uh, when, when, uh, so whenever it's conducive, so this is where uh, we will later on uh, try to understand, predict when do these perturbations go. So whenever the situations are conducive, so the instability grows exponentially. So these are the phases that you see here, right? So these are the, these are the growing perturbations for a particular parameter. And whenever it's not uh, conducive, these perturbations decay exponentially. So when the growth phases are more important than the decay phases, you get an instability which is growing exponentially. And when you do not have a st strong enough growth phases, then the system just decays exponentially. So now the question that we are interested in asking is, can we predict such kind of uh, instability? Uh, or can we, can we try to understand when do these uh, three-dimensional perturbations grow on top of these uh, underlying fluctuating uh, two-dimensional flow? Uh, underlying columnar vertices, right? So this is a uh, this is a turbulent problem, highly nonlinear problem. So one has to do a lot of simulations because there's no analytical solution to turbulence that is available. And basically, uh, one tries to understand. So basically, we are interested in finding this threshold. And uh, this threshold actually, uh, so depending on the uh, domain of the system. So basically, there's some aspect ratio dependence that comes in. So depending on the aspect ratio. Uh, we can find we can sketch out this uh, this domain which differentiates between two dimensional turbulence to 3d turbulence so as we cross this we 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 uh, transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence and the control parameter so depending on how you cross it you can either uh, reduce the rotation rate so basically go from a 2d turbulence state to a 3d state or uh, you can increase the Reynolds number also and you can also transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence by increasing the Reynolds number you kind of make the system more fluctuating and that can also trigger certain kind of uh, instabilities which transition this flow from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence. So if you have any questions, feel free to stop me and ask. Yeah, okay. So uh, the uh, velocity field uh, that we have in the underlying uh, 2D turbulence is given by uh, the velocity field is basically, uh, it has two components because was I told it's basically two dimensional. So you have a velocity field component U, which is along the X direction, V along the Y direction. So this is uh, what is uh, basically the U2D component. And basically what we will be showing is that the uh, transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence is basically controlled by uh, the, uh, by the properties of the underlying flow. So this, uh, for the velocity field, one can define what is known as the vorticity. So it's basically how much uh, vertical the flow is and also what is known as the strain rate. So how much shearing is the flow. Uh, so by defining these two quantities, one can try to uh, basically predict uh, when does the flow transition from one to another. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, what we find is that uh, depending on where we are in this, uh, in this uh, threshold uh, that we are looking at, uh, uh, we have we can transition from one uh, form of turbulence. Excuse me, sir. Uh, there yes, is sir. a question in the chat box. Uh, okay, one second. Yeah, feel free to ask questions if you do not understand. How to understand the saturation in blue and green lines for low rotation rates? So, uh, yeah, so that I will come. I'll come to. Uh, so basically, uh, the question is, um, so why is there the saturation in this, uh, so why is the curve of this particular form, let's say. So basically, there's a, there's a transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence, and this threshold seems to become independent of the Reynolds number uh, for at very large values of the Reynolds number. So I, I, I'm guessing this is the question, and with this, I'll just come, come to the next slide. So basically, there's the properties of this transition. 
So this curve, the exact form of this curve is again related to these properties of these uh, quantities of the underlying flow structures. So that I will just discuss in the next slide. So depending on the, uh, the uh, on the aspect ratio of the system also, uh, if, if it's very thin, uh, one gets this blue line. If it's if it is uh, a tall box, one gets the uh, red line, and in between inter intermediate cases, one gets the green line. And uh, there's a, so uh, at certain regions, you get one form of uh, any one form of instability mechanism, and certain other regions, you get another form of instability mechanism, which I'm going to discuss in the next slide. So basically, we are starting with uh, columnar vertices, and what happens is that uh, so in certain so in this uh, transition uh, diagram, uh, what we see is that when uh, whenever the uh, if you are looking at low uh, not so high Reynolds numbers or in thin layers, what happens is that there is an instability mechanism which is given by the uh, Rayleigh criterion where the Contour rotating vortex. So you basically have two vortices, two strong vortices which are quickly set up, and there's one vortex which is rotating along with the global rotation, and another vortex which is rotating in the opposite direction to the global rotation. So when the rotation rate of the contour rotating vortex matches the rotation rate of the global rotation, they both kind of cancel out each other, and the particles inside the vortex no longer feel any effect of rotation. So what happens is that the uh, fluid parcels inside they become three-dimensional and this vortex starts to break down. So this is what is known as a centrifugal instability. And one can do some analysis and find out an exact criterion when such an instability breaks, when such a large-scale vortex breaks down. Right? So whereas the vortex which is rotating along with the rotation rate, that uh, because it's still rotating in the same direction, that no longer breaks down. That, that remains stable, whereas the one which is opposing the global rotation that starts to break down. Yeah, so that is the first mechanism through which uh, this columnar vortices break down, and these are the solid points here. So the ones which without any, uh, uh, so ones which are filled. So these are the points where you have this uh, rotation, uh, the uh, the contour rotating vortex, which breaks down to these perturbations, right? And then uh, one can write down the Rayleigh criterion. So one can uh, do some theoretical analysis and then show when does this happen. And this happens when the rotation rate of the contour rotating vortex and the global rotation, when they match exactly, one uh, one gets this instability. And in in the uh, turbulent situation, because the underlying flow is turbulent, one can do some kind of bounds uh, because one has to do some kind of averaging to say that when does this become unstable, and that leads to a constant, some Rossby number which is uh, proportional to some constant, less than or equal to some constant, and this independent this constant is independent of the Reynolds number. And that leads to the saturation that uh, the question was asked about. So the, in a sense, you have um, the, the uh, threshold becoming independent of the Reynolds number for such kind of instabilities. The second type of instability is uh, the excitation of uh, uh, inertial waves. So because the underlying flow is fluctuating, uh, so these fluctuations can excite these bulk waves, which I was talking about. And this, again, uh, it's a spontaneous emission. Because of the underlying turbulence, you kind of uh, one can excite uh, certain kind of uh, instabilities. Uh, so this is a parametric excitation, like uh, what happens when you take a, a pendulum and then you kind of oscillate the pendulum. So the sta the the point which is uh, below the stable point which was below that becomes unstable and the inverted pendulum becomes stable. So similar mechanism is uh, responsible for this destabilization of columnar vortices because of these fluctuations, one excites these bulk waves which travel within the fluid and break down these vortices. And that, uh, again, one can do some analysis and show that that leads to some scaling law, which is Rossby times Reynolds, which is a constant. And that explains uh, these two behavior in the limit of large Reynolds number, one leads to a constant, another leads to a scaling law, which is Reynolds times Rossby is constant. So basically, just stability analysis of this uh, turbulent flow, linear stability analysis of a turbulent flow to these perturbations and asking when does it become uh, stable, when is it becoming unstable. And from known literature, uh, one can look at, uh, one can derive certain scaling laws to understand the transition from one form of turbulence to another form of turbulence and get the scaling law. But what actually triggers these transitions 
is what I'll be uh, talking about next. So can we try to understand when do we get these growth phases? When do we get these decay phases? So at cert certain instances, you suddenly have then the vortices starting to break down and certain other instances, the vortices are uh, stable. Right? So when what triggers such kind of... Uh, 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 to, to, I have a doubt in the previous slide. Uh, yes, please. Uh, yes, please. Yes. So you said uh, R1 and RE, is the product of uh, these two should be a cost, approximately. Yeah, cost. yeah. For, for these, so for the, for does it mean that uh, they vary in the same order? Need was. Yeah. So the constant is a it's a function. It's a parameter of the uh, of the uh, of the problem. So it's okay. a geometric parameter. So uh, what happens is that uh, as as we increase the Reynolds number even further, one has to one has to keep rotating it faster and faster to maintain these strong columnar vertices, right? So that uh, basically it's, it's a really it's a it's a so this uh, particular scaling law tries to tell it tells us that uh, the faster the stronger the turbulence, the more difficult it is to maintain it two dimensionally. So, oh. that, so the the stronger the chaos or stronger the fluctuations, I mean, I, I kind of in, used chaos and turbulence interchangeably, but at least turbulence, uh, two-dimensional turbulence to be exact. Uh, so the underlying turbulence, uh, due to the strong fluctuations, um, they kind of, uh, it's, it's more difficult to maintain the turbulence, uh, the columnar vertices actually, in this particular structure. So what happens, there's a transition. Uh, so if the turbulence is stronger, then it's easier to, so as I said, you can also transition along this direction. When fluctuations become stronger, it's easier to break down these vortices. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other question? Okay, so I'll just continue. Um, so uh, as I said, you can transition from one form of turbulence to another. And uh, the question that we are interested in, uh, what is the, what can, can you predict when the, when do these growth phases occur? When do these decay phases occur? And what is the relation between such kind of, so this is what is known as a growth rate intermittency, as in there's an intermittency in the uh, growth rate. So intermittency is basically a non-aperiodic kind of uh, burst uh, in the system. And what we see is that there's an intermittency in the growth rate of the perturbations, right? So, uh, so there's an intermittency in the growth rate and the question is when can we predict when do these growth phases occur and when do these decay phases occur, right? And that for that one can look at depending on which uh, instability that one looks at. So if let's say it's the uh, it's this particular instability which is given by the Rayleigh criterion where the vorticity is important. So one can find out what is the minimum of the vorticity because we are interested in the opposite rotating vortex with respect to global rotation. We're looking at the negative values of vorticity. We can find out what is the minimum of the vorticity and uh, its correlation with the growth rate. And uh, so this is the y-axis is the growth rate. So it's d by dt log of the perturbation, which is basically uh, the growth rate. Uh, the log of the perturb perturbation goes like gamma t. The perturbation, if it goes like e to the power gamma t, log of it goes like gamma t, and d by dt of it is like gamma. Right? So this is like the growth rate. And this is like the uh, the minimum of the vorticity. Right? So this is a minimum along the uh, the entire domain actually. So it's a spatial minimum that we are taking. And what we find is that whenever, uh, so it's rescaled with the rotation rate, uh, it's again given by this Rayleigh criterion. So if you just consider this as some, kind of, some form of a minimum of the vorticity, what we find is that whenever the vorticities are very small, we get strong correlations uh, so strong growth rates, which are very positive, which are positive, as in whenever you have strong, uh, what strong contour rotating vortex, which are very negative, uh, you that triggers growth of these perturbations. So these phases are basically uh, uh, the underlying flow having strong fluctuations in the uh, vorticity, and the decay phases are when these fluctuations are not strong enough. So basically, whenever you have extreme fluctuations of the underlying vorticity, one gets this growth of these perturbations. Whenever it's not uh, fluctuating strong enough, then the system decays uh, exponentially. Yeah. So the role of this uh, extreme is that uh, extreme fluctuations of the underlying vorticity leads to growth of perturbations. And this is a spatial extrema. So you, one has a field of uh, 
uh, vorticity is a field e uh, it follows a field equation so it is a function of x y and t and at a given time one can look at what is the minimum of it and whenever this minimum uh, crosses a particular threshold then one sees a growth of these perturbations so so basically we can try to predict such perturbations by looking at the the extreme fluctuations of the underlying field. so this what is it because they are under they are fluctuating because of the two dimensional turbulent nature whenever the fluctuations are strong enough it kind of it leads to the breakdown of the water systems so due to the growth of perturbations um, yes but numerically how do you pick up this extreme values oh this, so basically this is an equation uh, which is basically so as i said the velocity equation can be written in terms of the uh, 2d turbulence equations which is u2d and the perturbation equations which are perturbations on top of this two dimensional flow right so basically what the vorticity is basically the curl of the velocity field yeah which is uh, basically um, so this is an equation that is being solved this is an equation that is being solved and okay. at every instant one can find out the vorticity which is the curl of the velocity field and one can find out the minima of the vorticity okay every instant one can find it and again the growth rate at every instant one can find by doing some kind of a finite difference and so on right and then uh, one can try to correlate see the correlation between the uh, growth rate and the minimum of the vorticity and whenever the vorticity crosses a particular threshold underlying vorticity crosses a particular threshold here is given by the rayleigh criterion whenever it crosses zero in the negative side uh, one gets strong growth of these perturbations and whenever the fluctuations are not strong enough then basically what happens is that the the perturbations decay exponentially okay yeah so extreme extreme fluctuations lead to this growth of these perturbations and this is for the vorticity and similarly one can do the same thing for the strain rate so here i show a video so this is the underlying vorticity and here this is not the vorticity which is important but the strain field so basically is the strength of the strain of the flow which is of importance and here so this is the underlying flow so these two plots are for the underlying flow so this is the vorticity field and this is the strain field and this is the uh, perturbation so this is the flow of this is the spatial uh, distribution of the perturbation amplitude it's a it's a it's a equation in terms of x y and t so basically it's a x y z and t so it's basically we are just taking a cut along one one uh, z plane and then we are looking at it as a function of x x and y all of this is a function of x and y this is the columnar vortices one is the positive one uh, red is the positive one blue is the negative one and uh, and for this vorticity field one can also find out the strain so strain is just uh, say defined before uh, is just a tensor quantity and then one can take the norm of the tensor uh, let's say the determinant and then find out uh, this particular find out the the spatial distribution of this determinant and here i showed the uh, energy that the uh, log of the energy as a function of time and uh, let me just play the video so what i want you to uh, focus upon is the fact that whenever you have this so basically the strain determinant is actually a negative quantity it's a it's a negative definite quantity and whenever the values become very very large and uh, the spatial location of the perturbation uh, matches with the large negative values uh, then you have a growth of these perturbations and whenever uh, there is no spatial correlation between them uh, one will get decay of these perturbations so let me just play the play the video so right now there is a correlation between the uh, uh, this is the perturbation uh, amplitude so the structure of the perturbation is lying exactly on top of the strain field and one has a growth of these perturbations the strong negative fluctuations lead to oh, so so growth of these perturbations and then uh, after some time one one would see that the other this particular vortex will start developing strong strain fields and because of the decorrelation the growth will stop and then uh, for for a long time if there is decorrelated they will start decaying also because of the dissipation effects and stuff so you have a decay of this uh, perturbations because right now the perturbation is uh, lying on this vortex whereas this the strain field is max is, is maximum here right and again when the strain field becomes maximum here uh, then what happens is that the perturbation again uh, starts growing so whenever you have this extreme fluctuations uh, of this uh, strain field and there's a there's a correlation between the perturbation and the strain field 
one starts seeing this growth of these uh, perturbations, which basically break down these large scale vortices. Right? So, uh, the previous uh, image I showed uh, the uh, um, extreme negative fluctuation of the vorticity, which led to positive growth rate. Right? And then uh, here, what I show is that extreme negative fluctuation of the strain rate. Right? Uh, that leads to growth of these perturbations. So again, one can do a similar uh, correlation diagram and uh, it will also lead to similar kind of, the, there's no exact threshold criterion, but it will also lead to such kind of a behavior, which shows that whenever you have negative, strong negative fluctu extreme fluctuations in these quantities, uh, you can, so here it's a field, so one has to take the minimum of this field. Uh, so you can correlate it again with the uh, growth of these perturbations so whenever one has extreme negative fluctuations, one has growth of the, one has uh, the growth of these perturbations, and it's a, it, it can be a uh, let's say uh, the extreme values itself can be a trigger for these perturbations, right? So now we have a method to predict these uh, burst phenomena, but can we try to predict? So basically, given that we have identified the marker which leads us to uh, this uh, transition from one form of turbulence to another, can we try to understand? The distribution of this uh, such kind of such kind of extreme fluctuations, which will which will help us to understand this uh, growth phase, and also help us understand when do these perturbations grow exponentially and when does it decay. Right? So basically, the uh, questions related to the exact threshold determination and also the form of intermittency, the critical exponents, uh, they are, they might all be related to related to the extreme fluctuations of the underlying flow. So now the uh, question is, can we try to understand the distribution of these extreme events? Right? So uh, basically, uh, the underlying flow, I'm just taking current. So for the next part of the talk, I'll just take uh, the flow to be uh, what is known as a two-dimensional turbulence. And uh, inspired by what, what I showed before, I'm just interested in trying to find out the distribution of the minimum of the vorticity and the distribution of the minimum of the strain rate. So uh, this is the equation for 2D turbulence. And uh, we, have, we are looking at what is known as the extreme values of the vorticity. So vorticity is defined as curl of the velocity field. So it has only one component in 2D, which is along the uh, vertical direction. And the rate of strain tensor is defined in this particular manner. And uh, basically, uh, it's a tensor quantity. Uh, it has two invariants. So the tensor depends on how you define the axes how you define x and y axis. So if you rotate the axis, one can get different components of the tensor, but there are two, there are two invariants for, the, for this tensor, which are basically trace and uh, the determinant. A trace, because of the incompressibility condition, can be shown to be zero, and it's basically a determinant which one is interested. And it's basically a determinant which I'm showing here. Right. So, uh, what we, so for the next part of the talk, I'm interested in finding out the distribution of this uh, negative values, the minimum values of these determinants, and this omega and the, the determinant uh, are basically field equations, so these are functions of x, y, and t, and uh, one is interested in the minimum, or the spatial minimum of these fields, so which I call it as omega min, uh, s min, of uh, which are functions of time. So at each instant, one gets a value over the whole field, and the question is, what is the distribution of these uh, minima? So, uh, are there any theory which can help us uh, understand such distributions of extremes? So, that has been done early on uh, in the 20th century. Uh, there were some early on mathematicians who looked at uh, the distribution of maxima or minima of a series of n independent, identically distributed random numbers. Right? So, what they found is that depending on the distribution of these uh, independent, identical random numbers, uh, the distribution of the extrema, like minima and maxima, they fall into one of the three distributions, either Gumbel, Fischer, or Weibel. So this is a famous theorem, which uh, which is called the fischer tippett uh, Denko theorem. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce this name. So this theorem uh, basically states that if you have independent and identically distributed random numbers, the extreme values will always fall into one of these three distributions. And these are the references that one can look at. So this, un this falls under the broad category of extreme value statistics. And uh, there are lot there's a whole field in itself where there are many people work, uh, statistical physicists, uh, 
uh, engineers, uh, finance uh, experts. So they all work on uh, such kind of uh, statistics to understand uh, when does one get strong fluctuations, uh, let's say in stock market or let's say in, uh, even let's say related to biological uh, systems, when does, when does one get strong fluctuations that is related to uh, what is known as extreme value statistics uh, problem. So we are interested in the such extreme value statistics because they trigger transitions from one form of turbulence to another. We want to understand uh, what is the form of distribution that we get. It is to be noted that the such theorems are valid in the independent and identically distributed random numbers. The question is what happens when you have correlated signals, which is basically turbulence. Right? So turbulence is not the flow of the fluid parcel. Uh, each fluid parcel is not independent of each other. They are all interacting through the field equation. And the question is, can we try to understand the distribution of these extremes, which will help us understand the whole problem of transitions between turbulent flows. Right? So for, uh, for the, just to introduce people to uh, this extreme value statistics, uh, I've just uh, taken a simple example to show how one gets what is known as the Gumbel distribution. So Gumbel distribution is when you have, uh, when one has exponentially or Gaussian uh, variables, uh, which are, so the tails decay faster than, uh, this is like an exponential or faster than an exponential, then what happens is that the extreme values of n number of independent random numbers goes to a Gumbel distribution. Here, I show the case for the uh, n independent Gaussian variables with zero mean and standard deviation sigma. So let us say we take n such variables, x1, x2, xt, and so on up to xn. And uh, one, I'm interested in finding the maxima, the distribution of the maxima. So if p of x equal to x max, can I find out the distribution of this p? Right? So basically at each instant, what, what one does is that they take out x1, x2, xt, and all xn from independent Gaussian distributions. So one gets a series of xn. And from that xn, we are interested in finding the maxima. So we repeat this, and then we'll get a, by plotting this maxima, one gets a distribution, which is what we are interested in, E of x max. So for this particular problem, because these are all independent, uh, what we can, we can do a simple analysis. So here I say, uh, I'm trying to find out P of x equal x max. In the first situation, the first variable can hit the x max, and all the other variables are always smaller than this x max, right? So that is what, uh, is one of them hits the maxima. So that is x1 equal to x max. The second situation, the second variable is the x max, and all the other variables are less than x max, and so on up till the situation where the nth variable hits the x max. So we sum all these uh, individual uh, processes where either any of them can become the maxima, and we are basically interested in finding out the distribution of this max x max, right? Because each of them follow the Gaussian distribution, uh, p of x less than x max, one has to just integrate the Gaussian. Um, it's a cumulative uh, distribution. So you are not uh, integrate the Gaussian from minus infinity to x max, and that gives you uh, this particular term, for example. And x1 equal to x max, one has to just sub substitute that value into the Gaussian. And one can do this analysis, and uh, just by simplifying, you get one gets uh, p of x max to be this particular expression, but this ERF is this uh, uh, error function, this modified error function that one gets. So this is the situation when one takes n independent Gaussian variables, uh, which are identically distributed. And in the limit of large n, one can show that this leads to what is known as the Gumbel distribution, which has this particular form, exponential of minus s times exponential of minus exponential to the power minus s. So there's a double exponential here. But this is some rescaled uh, uh, parameter, which mu prime and sigma prime are some functions of this capital N. So one can show that this in the limit of large n, this distribution of uh, the maxima or minima of the n independent Gaussian variables goes to the famous Gumbel distribution. Now the question is what happens to 2D turbulence, right? So we are interested in this breakdown of this column now vortices. So this is a negative. So here, this is the negative vortex. This is a positive vortex here. Sorry about the change of color. So the question is when do these uh, vortices break down? And that is related to extreme fluctuations of the negative vorticity, which is shown by plus sign, or the strong negative strain rate, which is shown by the circle. So here I show some different situations, where depending on the parameters, one can find out uh, different uh, locations of these, uh, of these uh, extreme vorticity and extreme strain rates, right? So one, there's no easy way of finding out, 
So numerically, one has to find out at each and every instant what is the exact value and then construct a distribution. Like how one does for uh, this n independent values, which one can actually treat it analytically, but one can also do it numerically and show the same thing. So here, there's no analytical easy way of doing it. So I'll just do it numerically. Right? So this is a numerical exercise of uh, finding the extreme values of uh, spatial extremes of vorticity and, and strain rate. And what we find is that we uh, get a distribution. So as we're increasing uh, the uh, non-dimensional numbers, so, uh, so basically the Reynolds number in this situation, what one gets is the distribution becomes uh, uh, more and more uh, so spread out, right? And also the uh, extreme value statistics predictions, one can fit it also. So these are the dashed lines. And we see that they are not a good fit for these extreme value statistics, the extremes of these uh, distributions, right? So even though they could predict for independent identical random numbers, for the situation of uh, of uh, extreme values of vorticity and strain rate in a turbulent flow, they fail miserably, right? So this is for the strain rate, this is for the vorticity, and one can see that the extremes of these are not fitted well by these. Uh, what is the what are the standard distributions of the extreme value statistics literature? Right, and uh, so th there's a strong dependence. So here again, I vary what is known as elastical friction. So one need not worry about it. So there's a strong dependence on the dissipation coefficients that uh, one can see. So even if one rescales the distribution with the uh, with the respective standard deviations, one can see that the uh, even if the tails one can if one can try to match the uh, the central part of the distribution also starts to modify. Right, so there's a strong dependence in the uh, dissipation coefficients, so basically the Reynolds numbers of the system, and there's no universal distribution to go to. So now the question is, can we try to understand where does this uh, problem come from, right? So can we try to understand uh, what leads to such kind of distributions? Uh, and uh, by understanding, yes? I have a question. Um, this omega minimum, uh, this uh, x-axis. Yes. Uh, you have negative values, is that what Yes, you yeah. Uh, so this, these are the values basically. So you have the negative vorticity. Oh. So this is a fee. So the average of vorticity over the whole system is zero by conservation, and uh, uh, so we kind of angle. So we start. Uh, so if we take the equation because of periodicity, one one can show that the average of vorticity is zero of the whole domain. So one has equal amount of positive and negative vortex, and uh, here we are looking at the uh, negative vortex uh, that we are. That is uh, present here. Here is the positive vortex, and uh, for the at, at every instant, one can find out what is the minimum of this particular the vorticity field, and that will give you that will give us one value. So at every instant, one can do that, and one can construct a distribution out of it. And these are all negative values, and one gets a distribution of this uh, probability of omega min. Oh, thank you. Uh, any other question? Yeah, so these distributions do not seem to work well. And the question is, can we try to understand that? So for that, I will invoke, uh, for the last part of this talk, I'll invoke what is known as the truncated Euler equations. So basically, these are equations. So the Navier-Stokes equations have the dissipation coefficients which govern them. So in these systems, the truncated Euler equation, we basically take the Navier-Stokes equations and throw out dissipation and forcing. So basically, we take the Euler's equations, right? And then we basically try to understand what is the solution of these Euler's equations, right? So these are, uh, so basically I call it truncated Euler's equation because I will truncate it up to a certain wave number. If you take Euler's equation and integrate, they go to uh, infinitesimally small length scales, which we try to avoid. So we truncate it up to a particular length scale and ask the question uh, for this equilibrium system. So because here there's no dissipation of forcing, the, con the, uh, 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 the conserved quantities uh, so there are conserved quantities. So for example, energy is a conserved quantity in the system. And in two dimensions, there's an additional conserved quantity, which is known as the entropy. So one has two conserved quantities in the system in the absence of dissipation and forcing. So for this equilibrium system, which also leads to some form of spatiotemporal chaos or uh, this, this form of, uh, I wouldn't call it turbulence because there's no viscosity. Uh, so such uh, spatiotemporal chaos, um, can we try to understand the distribution of this vorticity and uh, extreme values of vorticity and strain rate, right? So similar to these distributions, can we try to do that? So this is a non-equilibrium system. 
can we try to do try can we try to do that for the equilibrium system uh, there is a question on the chat box oh yes please oh this is rescaled for the this is rescaled and we uh, we i mean i also removed the mean yeah sorry i should have mentioned that so i kind of rescaled it and also removed the mean actually so that is how i kind of shift them and then put the mean to be zero for these distributions so the, even though the vorticity distributions themselves are negative the rescaled and uh, i put the mean also the distributions to be zero so i removed the mean and the standard and i put standard deviation of this curve to be one and even then uh, we do not get a universal distribution for these 16 value statistics meaning they are still functions of the dissipation coefficients or the reynolds number of the flow uh if you have any other question uh, yeah i'll be happy to answer okay so uh, uh, yeah there is a question from oh, there is a question from professor mori uh, sir Oh, yes. You are muted, Professor Boris. Professor Boris, you are muted. Uh, please, uh, yes, unmute yourself. And now, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, sorry. Um, um, the question is: uh, You mentioned the truncated Euler's equation. Equations. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, can you effectively um, uh, determine the minimum number of modes which is sufficient for effective use of these truncated equations? Uh, so that's a very good question. Um, so the truncated Euler equations, um, they have uh, been successful to some extent to capture the large scale dynamics of uh, 2D turbulence, right? So basically, if you take, uh, let's say, some of the transitions that I talked about. So for example, in this initial uh, transitions between uh, such kind of uh, large scale structures, or even this atmospheric flow, some of the examples, people have tried to study, use the truncated Euler equations to capture certain kind of uh, transitions between different turbulent flows. But the truncated Euler equations are efficient only to predict the uh, transitions in the large scale structures. So the minimum number of modes that one looks at, uh, so for different systems, it de depends. So for example, for these large scale reversals of these large scale modes, uh, people found around 11 modes to be of importance. And for large scale jets in the atmosphere, such, such kind of transitions, people found uh, 15 modes to be of importance. Mm -hmm. That is the okay. minimum number of modes. And then one can actually make it more, you can, can, one can continue adding the number of modes that wouldn't change the prediction of such instabilities. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, any other question? Okay. So um, I'll just continue. Um, so as I was mentioning, uh, this truncated Euler equations, they're effective in capturing the large scale dynamics of uh, turbulence, though they might not necessarily capture uh, the small scale dynamics exactly. So uh, Recently, people have used it for studying 3D turbulence, 2D turbulence, uh, trying to understand the absolute equilibrium. So basically, these are large scales, larger than the forcing scale. Uh, there are some uh, recent interesting works where people have tried using ideas from truncated Euler equations to understand statistics of turbulent flows. And if one looks at uh, exact Euler equations, uh, so this is not the truncated Euler equations, where, so these are equations where you conserve all the invariance of the vorticity uh, so there are some interesting works also where people have studied certain kind of uh, bifurcations uh, in uh, in the context of geophysics. Right? So uh, Euler's equations uh, in certain situations can capture certain interesting properties of turbulence. And our question is that can we try to understand it in the context of uh, uh, extreme value statistics that uh, that uh, we are interested to uh, to to find transitions between uh, different types of turbulent flows. So uh, to understand the truncated Euler equations, because it's an equilibrium system, one can in invoke equilibrium statistical mechanics. So one has, uh, so for the, there are two conserved quantities, energy and entropy. So in the canonical distribution, we can define some inverse temperatures and write this as exponential minus alpha E and minus beta omega. And uh, because the truncated Euler equation is an equilibrium system, it only depends on the initial condition. So Kc, 
uh, will will tell us uh, which is the ratio of the entropy over the energy which is some kind of a wave number in the system by controlling the kc uh, with respect to the uh, some cut off wave numbers we can basically tell us uh, we can basically control the kind of uh, turbulence that one gets in these systems i mean uh, spatial temporal chaos that one gets in uh, punctured euler systems and kreiknan who uh, who pioneered this work uh, found three different distributions type 1 type 2 and type 3 depending on the values of kc so this is known in the literature but the question that we are asking is uh, we are not interested in the energy spectra so this is the energy distribution across different length scales uh, so depending on uh, how kc is uh, is situated with respect to uh, some other parameters of the problem uh, one can get a s situation where energy is concentrated more at large scales than at small scales uh, some intermediate case and a case where there's more energy at small scales than large scales so by controlling different types of uh, the controlling this kc which is the control parameter one can get different energy distributions across different length scales but the question that i am interested in asking is uh, how is the distribution of the uh, minimum of the uh, energy and the so minimum of the vorticity and the strain rate how are they distributed in such equilibrium systems right so basically uh, first i will try to integrate these equations uh, numerically so these are integrations where you conserve the energy and the entropy for different values of this control parameters and we know for a canonical ensemble uh, for example the velocity field uh, if you have a, a canonical ensemble of particles uh, we know that that follows a gaussian distribution and the energy follows a boltzmann distribution so second order quantity goes like exponential uh, whereas the first order quantity is a gaussian distribution so for this system of equations we again integrate in, in space and time and then ask the question what is the minimum of the vorticity and uh, steam function so psi is just a, 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 some kind of a vector potential for the uh, for the velocity field so this is usually how one represents the uh, punctured euler equations even though one can also write it in this particular format so um, we take this equations and then we again find the distributions so first we find that the vorticity at any point Right. you can take the vorticity at not the, not the minimum just take the vorticity and the determinant of strain uh, of the strain rate at any point so that follows a nice gaussian distribution so this is a first order quantity like the velocity in a, in a canonical uh, distribution in uh, statistical mechanics equilibrium in statistical mechanics of a particle of the velocity of a gas particle let's say so that we know that follows a nice gaussian distribution and this happens when we have sufficiently enough number of modes it follows a nice gaussian distribution when we do not have sufficiently enough number of modes then uh, yeah when cases are very small uh, when we do not have enough interaction between these modes then uh, the distribution starts deviating from the canonical distribution and this goes into what is known as the micro canonical distribution right when the dynamics is very constrained and similarly for the second order quantity we get a nice exponential the boltzmann kind of distribution for the rate of uh, the strain rate tensor at a particular point so these are not the minimum but at any point it's a gaussian and for this one it's an exponential right and we know that uh, the spatial the spatial minima is basically the collection of the mini it's a basically a minima of these points uh, over this particular domain and because these distributions are nicely gaussian and exponential uh, we can again invoke uh, the uh, Uh, we can ask the question do we get a gumbel distribution given that uh, these are nice exponentials and gaussian distribution and what we find is that we do get end up with a gumbel distribution so here is the minimum value of the vorticity as a function of different values of kcs and what we see is that uh, so these dashed lines are basically gumbel fits and uh, this uh, black dash dotted line is a exact analytical solution that we derived early on and what we see is that uh, for the, for systems which have enough number of interacting modes the system is the, the distributions are exactly fitted by the analytical solution whereas for systems which are in the micro canonical ensemble where the deviation there's a deviation from the gaussian and the exponential distribution there's a slight deviation from the exact form of the gumbel distribution right so we do get back the gumbel distribution in equilibrium system but in non equilibrium system there's a difference uh, there we get a non trivial distribution so basically in given that both systems are chaotic so both systems are spatial temporal chaos what sets the distribution to be non trivial here 
what sets the distribution to be the gumball distribution in this particular system so is there a way to understand uh, or is there something to look at to better understand such systems right so uh, with that uh, we looked at the uh, power spectrum or the temporal correlation of these uh, signals so you take the vorticity or the uh, let's say here i only take the vorticity at a particular point and then i look at what is known as the power spectrum so if you are let's say you have a signal x of t one does the fourier transform x hat of f and looks at the distribution of uh, the uh, power across different frequencies and what one sees in a navier stokes equation is that one gets a flat line at low frequency like white noise and then at large frequencies one gets a distribution which is f to the power minus alpha where alpha is 1.5 and whereas for the truncated euler equation it's a flat line followed by an exponential uh, cut off right so basically the, for the truncated euler equation it almost behave like behaves like a white noise system whereas for the navier stokes equation it's a correlated system right it follows some f to the power minus alpha statistics similar to one over f noise statistics so there's a strong correlation which drives the navier stokes equation as compared to the truncated euler equation even though both shows spatial temporal chaos and with that uh, so recently there has been a lot of interest in understanding uh, extreme noise statistics uh, in many one over f type noise systems correlated signals so instead of taking any independent uh, processes can we if we can correlate them with each other with some statistics f to the power minus alpha uh, can we try to uh, get the extreme values of these uh, systems right and there have been others for example uh, satya mashumdar and alan alan comte who have studied um, such kind of uh, i mean especially especially extended systems like edward wilkinson's model where they also tried to find out the extreme values of these correlated systems and what they found is that in many of these systems the exact distribution is very uh, system dependent right so one it depends on the boundary condition it depends on exact quantities of interest so i uh, Uh, i suggest uh, to people if they want interested in this topic to go and check the recent reviews review article by satya majumdar uh, and co-authors on uh, spatial extreme i mean on extremal statistics of correlated signals right so basically when we have strongly correlated signals alpha greater than 1 so if p of f goes like f to the power minus alpha and alpha is greater than 1 uh, in many of the situ- in in all the situations it shows some non trivial distributions and whenever alpha is between 0 and 1 so 0 is the case f to the power 0 which is a flat line which is like the white noise there you do not get any uh, we expect the standard distributions to occur and when alpha is between 0 and 1 one gets uh, uh the gumbel uh, kind of statistics right and then one can actually construct such signals uh, so here the i construct different correlated signals with the different values of alpha and one gets uh, so depending on alpha values so the red line here is the is the fit and the blue are the histograms so depending when alpha is greater than 1 one one's can see the deviation from the standard gumbel distribution right so strongly correlated signals leads to non trivial distributions right so basically uh, with that i conclude so basically we kind of look at non trivial uh, distributions in correlated systems so strong spatial temporal correlations lead to non trivial distributions for the spatial extremes There's a sensitive dependence on param- dissipation parameters. Uh, similar kind of systems in the equilibrium setting gives you a nice uh, gumbel distribution. So the question is, what are the? So can we try to find the exact form of these distributions? Is there a limiting distribution at all in the limit of large and large number? Uh, even in such equilibrium systems, the microcanonical s- seems to de- differ from the gumbel distribution. And whether uh, how are these related to critical transitions? a growth rate intermittency and anomalous exponents that we discussed early on and more than these distributions it uh, such kind of uh, observations are also linked to many climate uh, related phenomena even though i do not work on these uh, particular topics it has been observed that many of the uh, if, uh, in, in climate science people are interested in this return times of extreme fluctuations and what they find is that uh, there's a lot of these correlations which lead to uh, strong uh, co- strong uh, the strong correlations lead to this f1 by f to the power alpha statistics and and that uh, has a different form of distribution than the standard ones that is known right 
so with that i conclude so for any other uh, so this is just a basically the same thing that i have said uh, in uh, put in a different way so for people who are interested they can check out the references and i thank my collaborators uh, for my phd and postdoc and also the current students who are working so i thank you and if you have any questions i'll be happy to take uh, thank you, Dr. Kamabra. Um, so the session is open for questions, doubts, clarifications. Yes, yes sir. Yes, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question also related to the truncated Euler's equation. If <laughs> instead of the truncated Euler equations, you try to use the truncated Navier-Stokes equations, is it is the theory similar or there are essential differences when you take into regard explicitly the viscosity and the uh, uh, pump? Uh, interesting question. So, um, yeah, so the truncated Navier Stokes equation uh, in certain limits mimics the uh, truncated Euler equations, just that uh, there's a correlation with additional correlation which is induced. Due to the viscous terms. So even though the energy spectra might look similar, I do not know about the spatiotemporal correlation. So I'm afraid I do not know the answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other question from students? Okay, we are not receiving questions from the students. Okay. So, since there are no more questions, uh, I would like to conclude the session uh, by thanking Dr. Kanabran for accepting our invitation and giving a very wonderful talk on next in value statistics. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a question in the chat box. It seems. Oh, okay. Um, uh, is there any connection between distribution found? And the extreme value scale dependence. Um, I'm afraid I do not understand the question. Uh, any distribution, sorry, any correlation? Uh, he wrote again. Oh, it's temporal and, uh, yeah. So basically the spatial scales, uh, mm -hmm. so again, um, I only talked about the correlation, I mean the differences in the spatial, the temporal correlations. <coughs> Because we are looking at uh, spatial extreme values, I have not considered uh, these spatial correlations. But let's say uh, in statistical physics, uh, people do look at the distribution of extremes, like how are the different extremes, like the first maxima, second maxima, third maxima, how are they distributed? So if one looks at that, the, the lens, the, the spatial extent over which uh, this maxima decays so then spatial correlations also become important and there the term spatial, spatial lens scales might also be of importance is what I think uh, uh, I might answer to that question. Uh, so for the extreme spatial extremes, uh, I have not uh, seen any kind of dependence, uh, at least from these kind of statistics, as long as f to the power minus alpha with alpha less than one was found, uh, we could uh, more or less uh, see that it deviated from the uh, predictions. Um, with respect to um, uh, coherent lens, uh, so basically one can one has to find out this. For the moment, we have only found out f to the power minus alpha, with alpha being uh, less than one, leading to uh, such kind of uh, non-trivial distributions. So I do not know about uh, coherence time. So there are more complicated quantities that one can look at, but for the moment we only looked at this exponent. Yeah, I think he said thank you. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for uh, inviting me to give this talk. I'm sorry if I went uh, much beyond no, the. Time. No, 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 no. It's okay. It's a very wonderful talk. <laughs> it's a wonderful talk. Okay. Uh, the other details I will write to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir.